Greetings. I hope and trust I find you well, my dear friends. This is a sequel on remuneration. I'll basically call it remuneration part B. And for this time, we're not only looking at the contract and the authority that is vested in the employees. What we want to look at basically are the deductions that are going to be effected on an employee's salary. So as we look at the part of employment law, we want to look at section number 12, subsection 5 of the Labor Relations Act. We also want to look at subsection number 6. But before we do so, why don't we spend a moment in prayer as our custom is? Let us pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege of calling upon your name. As we gather to discuss these issues that may be academic and affect our employment environment, dear Lord, we may be afflicted physically as we are suffering the scourge of the modern pandemic of the coronavirus. Some of us have other ailments that they may be suffering. How I pray, dear Lord, that you may heal one and all according to your riches and glory. For you are the great physician who is now near to heal and to save. In Jesus' name we pray and we ask, Amen. Without further ado, come with me to the Labor Relations Act. As mentioned earlier, we are at section 12. We want to look at subsection number 5. Listen to what it says. All remuneration shall be accompanied by a written statement showing the following. A, the name of the employer and the employee. We've already discussed why we need the name of the employer and the employee. Remember, the relationship between the employer and the employee is premised on there being an undertaking to pay or an actual payment of a salary. So the pay slip is evidence enough of this relationship and it must bear the name of the employee. It must also bear the name of the employer. Come to be the amount of remuneration and the period in respect of which it is paid. So you could be paid annually, you could be paid monthly, you could be paid uh, by, I mean, fortnightly, you could be paid weekly, you could be paid daily. Of course, I don't expect you to get paid annually. That would be way, 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 way too late to keep it. But usually somewhere between a day and a month will still be acceptable. Let's look at C. The component of the remuneration representing any bonus or allowance. So what we're looking at, remember we looked at the production schemes. So if there is any bonus or it's just a 13th check that is paid um, at the end of the year. Um, I, 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 read, I read in the papers that the Minister of Finance, Professor Mtuli, is thinking about uh, giving the civil servants a 13th check. That will be shown sometime next month. And he has even challenged those in the private sector to ensure that they also follow suit and take care of their employees. Now let's go to D. Any deductions. I'll have to come back to this one. The deductions must be reflected in the pay slip. And this is what we want to zero in on today. So let us have uh, just um, put this one on hold, put it on some ice. We'll come back and spend time on it. E, the net amount received by the employee after deductions. Now, the next item we want to look at is subsection number six. And this is what it says. No deduction or set off of any description shall be made from any remuneration except A, where an employee is absent from work on days other than industrial holidays or days of leave to which he is entitled. The proportionate amount of his remuneration only for the period of such absence. So what this basically means is no work, no pay. So if you are absent from work and you have not been given any leave, this is what we refer to as being AWOL, A-W-O-L, away without official leave. And if it is not an industrial holiday, it is a working day and you choose to be absent and you have not been granted either a vacation leave or a medical leave or a maternity leave or a special leave or a compassionate leave, depending on uh, what your employer provides for. 
you shall not be paid. There can be a deduction on your salary and that would be in order. That would be in order. Come to be. Amounts which an employer is compelled by law or legal process to pay on behalf of an employee. Now let us look at this. I mentioned earlier that we want to place this one on ice. Let it chill a bit so that we can come back to it. But let me just preempt a bit. So you will notice that the employer can make deductions on your salary. And these deductions are not only agreed upon. They can be as a result of being compelled by the law or a legal process. So what are those deductions that we can look at? When you go into your pay slip, ordinarily you're going to find that there's a deduction of NASA. This is the National Social Security Scheme. Or you're going to have, secondly, a deduction of the AIDS levy. And thirdly, you're going to have a deduction of pay as you earn or employment income tax. So these are the three basic deductions that you're going to find. But as we go into tax law, you're going to begin to realize that mm, it's not that simple. Out of these three, the only one that is a deduction in essence, in essence, becomes the AIDS levy. Oh, sorry, my, my apologies. Becomes the NASA. That becomes the only deduction. When you come to the AIDS levy and the payee, they are further down when you are done with the deductions. After, after even you are done with the credits, that's when you come to the tax liability. But for the employee, this is just simple and straightforward. I have three deductions on my pay slip, AIDS levy, NASA, and the um, pay as you earn. So if you abbreviate these, ANP, that is my obligation. Those are the issues that can be deducted from my salary. But you're also going to find that they could be deductions that are as a result of a legal process. What could be this legal process? A legal process could entail the garnishing of your salary. How would your salary be garnished? It would be on account of uh, maintenance. Should you go to um, um, court and uh, you're going through divorce proceedings and you, you are compelled to maintain your offspring, and when you are thus compelled, that is a result of a legal process, by that order, you are going to find that the employer has a responsibility to garnish your salary, to make deductions and pay whatever obligations may have arisen because of that. Now let's look at C, where an employee has received an advance of remuneration due the amount of such advance up to an amount not exceeding 25% of the gross remuneration owed. So you could have a scenario whereby the employee comes over and says, may you um, help me with um, uh, 200 United States dollars. Uh, my money is running a bit short. And you check how much do you earn, by the way, and you discover the employee earns $200. So in essence, they have asked for an advance. So being the business uh, person you are, now you want to begin to think about the authority that you have and the ostensible authority you may have. So when you then advance, to advance basically is to give someone the money ahead of work. So when you advance this employee that amount, what you have actually committed the employer to is that you are not going to recover you are not going to recover more than 25% of the gross remuneration. So this basically says, in other words, if you are prudent, do not advance an employee anything more than 25%. Because should you advance them a whole 100%, you're going to collect this sum over four months. Because you're going to collect 25%, 25%, 25%, 25 and the last 25%. So this is how you're going to basically recover the money, and that is tantamount to a loan. So this is where the law simply states, and I'm going to read it again, where an employee has received an advance of remuneration due, the amount of such advance up to an amount not exceeding 25% of the gross remuneration owed. So this is the maximum that you can um, deduct from a salary. And you're going to find that in subsection 7, this is also repeated as an umbrella clause that covers all deductions, but we should, we should get there shortly. And then a D, by written stop order for contributions to insurance policies, pension funds, 
medical aid societies, building societies, burial societies, and registered trade unions. So when you get now into your tax law, you're going to find that these are deductible expenses, some of them, not all of them. For example, your pension funds are going to be deductible and you are not going to be um, levied uh, a tax on account of those. And the other that you're going to find is approved donations. Uh, these are some of the things we're going to look at later on. Just hang around. And here's the other thing that you're going to find. Now let's get to E. By written consent of an employee for repayment of money learned by the employer on terms that have been mutually agreed to between the parties concerned. So um, as we go into item E, it might appear as if we now have the leeway of having an employee write out and sign up that, you know, I have this problem at home. I, I, I'm writing to ensure that by the, by the end of the month, just don't pay me. Don't pay me. You have already paid me and that's enough. Well, they may write, they may consent, but remember, any agreement that is done in contravention of a standing law of a contravention of a statute is illegal. So it does not assume legality because you have signed for it. It does not. So what that means is that come month end, you owe that person 75% of his or her salary, no matter what they have fallen into. This is the law. This is the law. That's what it is. That's what it is. Come to F. An amount recovered for payments made in error. So what is a payment made in error? This is, um, let's say you're going to have, we discussed this, um, we talked about um, uh, common mistakes and we spoke about, um, to say if the mistake is common on both sides, an agreement does not come into effect. So here we are, we have um, an agreement. The person who has been paid has a duty to return what has been paid over and above. But should we have a scenario whereby this is my employee and somehow, somehow, we happen to do the payroll and um, by mistake, by mistake, salaries go through ahead of time. Should salaries be punched and they go through by the 15th when they should go on by the 25th? We cannot then go on and deduct, even though this amount has been paid in error. We can deduct up to a certain level. I, I do not believe this is um, a fair way to do it because we're having a scenario whereby this now becomes a, a situation of being paid where you have not worked. So payments made in error, they should not generally, generally come to life. They should not ordinarily come to life. I don't see how the courts, I'm here to find a case, I'm, I'm going to look into it. I'm here to find a case whereby someone would have been paid in error and they would say, I'm not going to return the money, now start deducting it at 25%. I, I, don't, I don't think uh, that would be proper. Most um, codes of conduct would definitely have to deal with you for either embezzlement or conversion into personal use because that is not money that was intended for you. But uh, all in all, let's wrap it up at number seven. Listen to what subsection seven says. The aggregate amount of permissible deductions that may be made from the remuneration of any employee in any pay interval shall not exceed 25% of the employee's gross remuneration for that interval. So why do we need to have that interval specified in the pay slip, which we found in subsection number five, so that we would know where the 25% cutoff ought to be. So when you are being paid monthly, that is going to be the basis of establishing where the 25% cutoff ought to be. So these are the parameters beyond which the employer cannot encroach. They cannot encroach. But this is not supposed to be an open-ended, open-ended kind of arrangement. It only applies where the relationship continues to subsist, where the employer-employee relationship continues to exist. So the reason is, basically, your employee has a standard of living that you have gotten him accustomed to. So when you begin to deduct more than 25%, in essence, you are lowering his or her standard of living to levels that he or she is not accustomed to. 
Therefore, keep it at 75%. That is the rationale in other words. Make sure you do not, do not prejudice the employee because of these issues in spite of the items that are going to appear at items A up to F. You cannot prejudice the employee to that extent. However, this obligation would expire. When does it expire? Continue to paragraph 2 of subsection 7. It goes on to say, provided that upon termination of an employee's service, an employer may deduct from the total remuneration due to the employee an amount equal to any balance which may be due to the employer in terms of paragraphs A, C, E, or F. So should we come to an end? Our deal ends here. The employer has no bars. They can deduct everything that they are owed from their terminal benefits. Why should they deduct everything they are owed? The reason is simple. They have no control over your finances anymore. They have no means of following up with you except through a, a, de a, debt, a debt collector or, or, or through some other um, court, 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 court order. So because of that, the Labor Act now provides a window for the employer to deduct everything. Now, with that out of the way, we are done with our background. Now, let's go to the main issues of our discussion for today. We want to look at the mandatory deductions. And these are as found in item B. And item B says amounts which an employer is compelled by law mandated by law, enforced by law, expected by law, driven by law to deduct and pay on behalf of an employee. And these are some of the issues that we're going to find. If we go to the Finance Act at section 14, subsection 7, we're going to find the first reference to the AIDS levy. This is what it says. In respect of the year of assessment beginning in the 1st January 2010, and any subsequent year of assessment, they shall be charged in the case of a person other than a company or trust, an AIDS levy equal to 3% of the amount of income tax with which he or she is chargeable in terms of subsection 2A or B in respect of that year of assessment. After the deduction of any credits that are to be deducted, under part two of this chapter. And the levy shall be payable in addition to the income tax with which the person is chargeable under this section. Now let us go through this a little slower. I want to identify the issues that we're going to come back to. Notice that this is an AIDS levy that ap applies to natural persons. It does not apply to companies. It does not apply to trusts, but it applies to individuals, to employees. And what is this inclusive of? It is 3% of the amount of income tax. So what is this amount of income tax? We're going to get to a point where we're going to do a calculation and say, what is the taxable income? It is basically gross income minus the deductions. Then you get your income, your amount of income tax. So when you then calculate that and go further down, you're going to get to a part where you establish the tax liability. So when you get to the tax liability, this is the amount that is chargeable, the income tax with which the person is chargeable. So we're going to look at some of these, but we'll stay away from the numbers. I'll leave the numbers for tax law which you're going to be covering at some point if you have not already done so. Now, let us jump over to subsection 8. Subsection 8 now relates to companies and trusts. This is what subsection 8 says. In respect of the year of assessment beginning on the 1st January 2010 and any subsequent year of assessment, there shall be charged in the case of a company or trust an AIDS levy equal to 3% of the amount of income tax with which the company or trust is chargeable in terms of Section 2C in respect of that year of assessment. 
and the levy shall be payable in addition to the income tax with which the company or trust is chargeable under this section. So what have we said so far? We have this particular AIDS levy that is chargeable. If you go into the uh, National AIDS Council Act, you're going to find that this uh, levy basically takes care of um, prevention of AIDS, the um, cure of AIDS, and the funding basically of the processes that have to deal with uh, combating combating the, the scourge of the HIV virus. So when we look at this, the issue is it should benefit all persons who could seek aid at some point. They must find access to these means, and that is why when you get to the clinics, you will find that uh, people are told that um, antiretroviral treatment is free. It is not really free. Antiretroviral treatment is funded and how is it funded? It is funded by the employees. So when we go back to our first presentation, we said the government, parliament, the legislature actually, makes the laws for the good governance, for accountability and participatory decision making. So what are we doing here? Everyone is being brought on board to play a part, to contribute towards addressing the issue of the HIV pandemic. So because we are invited, it is not optional. This is mandatory. When we get employed, we cannot come back and say, you know what, when this law was designed, I was never consulted. I, I, I am HIV negative. I see no reason why I should contribute towards the AIDS fund. That is not an option that we can exercise. That is an option that is already made for us. So this is what I want us to take note of. So we're going to have a situation where the employer contributes 3%. The employee contributes 3% towards this AIDS levy. And we're even told that this AIDS levy is supposed to be 3% of the gross income. Did I, did I get that right? AIDS levy, this is as far as the employee is concerned, to 3% of the amount of income tax, not the gross income, by the way, yes, after the deductions. And we're going to go into what the gross income is. These may be uh, simple uh, statements that we think we understand. But as we go on, you may find that they are a little more complicated when we get to go deeper into them. Now, there is the other deduction that we have. This one is a deduction, a straight deduction. Why do I say so? Because the AIDS levy is while it appears as a deduction on your payslip, it is not really um, a deduction in the truest sense. A deduction is what contributes to us reducing your tax liability. So your pension contribution reduces your tax liability, while the AIDS levy is paid in addition to your pay as you earn. So I, I want us to take note of this. So just allow me to go back and uh, take it again. At the end, it says, and the levy shall be payable in addition to the income tax with which the person is chargeable under this section. So we need to appreciate that. When we get to the AIDS levy, it is added. You pay it. But when you look at your tax liability, even though you're contributing 3% towards the... Um, the, the pension fund, that particular 3% is going to be factored out when you are calculating the tax liability. This is going to become clearer as we go on. But basically on the NASA deductions, this one is another straightforward one. What does it provide for? An employee is supposed to pay 3.5% of his gross income before deductions. So these deductions is the 3.5% that is seemingly being deducted from your salary. It is the 3.5% that is also being factored out of your tax liability. So uh, I, I cannot overstress this. Even though it appears like three deductions, they do not have the same effect mathematically. They do not have the same effect mathematically. So to whom does this um, apply? To whom does NASA apply? NASA basically applies to all the Employees. I think it was Nyambir, Nyambirai versus uh, um, Zimra. 
Was it, you know, it was Nyambirai versus NASA. It should have been a 1995 case where the court actually found that it was constitutional for the citizens of Zimbabwe to undertake or be part of this mandatory uh, scheme. And this particular scheme is two-pronged. It's number one, it is uh, a pension fund. And secondly, it is a workers' compensation fund in the event of someone being hurt at work. So it, it is two-pronged. So to whom does this basically apply? Number one, to every person who is gainfully employed in Zimbabwe, in any profession, in any profession, you should contribute towards NASA. And number two, the person should be a citizen or ordinarily resident in Zimbabwe. So what is residence? Residence would mean, number one, it could be an immigration status. So someone will have a permit. If you have a permit, a temporary employment permit, we call them TEPs. If you have a TEP, you're going to be covered under Section 1. Everyone who is gainfully employed in Zimbabwe, in any profession. So whether you have a TEP or you have an ordinary residence or you have a citizenship, you have acquired citizenship status, even though you are not a native of the country, you're going to pay NASA. Secondly, should you be a citizen by birth or acquired, you're going to pay NASA. And for you to be ordinarily resident, what does this mean? As I've mentioned earlier, it could be an immigration status. To be ordinarily resident can also assume another meaning. The meaning is you could have a scenario whereby you are out of the country uh, for business from time to time. You're, you're being posted, I mean, to uh, a subsidiary organization. So when you are away from your post, what the calculation is, is when you are around in Zimbabwe for about 183 days, you are considered to be ordinarily resident in the country. So the taxes will apply to you and NASA will apply to you. And um, if you just do your math pretty well, around 183 will give us about half a year. So if you're going to be in the country about half a year, you're going to be liable for NASA. You're going to be liable for the taxes. Now, number three, it also... Uh, covers people who have attained 16 years of age. Now, um, go back to Section 11 of the Labor Relations Act. If, if I remember, let me pull it up. You'll notice that the Labor Relations Act provides that these people who are around 16 years can be apprentices, not employees. So I, I, I think there is um, um, a dichotomy here. There, there is a need to refine this because you will not ordinarily be an employee if you're 16 years of age, you need to be 18 years and above. So that is what ought to be the case there. And secondly, you must not be more than 65 years. So the minimum, the minimum threshold that you must exceed is 16 years. The cap that you should not exceed is 65 years. We shall get to the retirement benefits. Basically, you must be an active employee. Fourthly, Every employer is affected by this NASA contribution. How so? Because the employer has to register within a month of being formed, of coming into existence, or of coming into, of being registered by the registrar of companies. We did cover this in our previous video. So once you are conferred with full legal capacity, what it means is that immediately, your NASA returns become due and payable. And who is um, supposed to be covered? It would be even your directors. Your directors are employees in this sense. They are not employers, as it were. So you must return NASA for your directors. You must return NASA for your employees. So even if you're a two-man company, it does not mean you are exempt from this. As soon as you are registered and you have full legal capacity within a month, you must now start paying NASA returns. And should you not pay these NASA returns, I think the company registers um, in terms of uh, Form P2 and uh, the employees Form P3, and all these should be um, registered within the first month of employment or the first month of existence. So when these come into existence, what it simply means is that should you not then pay up your NASA now, let us jump uh, uh, number five. I'll move number five later on. 
there is a late payment that you would attract. And the late payment basically is 10% per month. And it is incremental. So if you do not make your NASA returns for month one, they will simply say, okay, these are your NASA returns plus 10%. And if they remain owing and pending by the second month, guess what? It becomes your NASA returns for month one plus 20%. And your NASA returns for month two, now you are owing, you see how it grows exponentially. So by the time you get to month three, you are owing, um, is it uh, 20% from month one and 10% from month two. So this uh, figure continues to balloon like that. So you need to make sure you are watching this to make sure that you are being compliant as far as these two provisions are concerned. This is basically for the employee and the employer. Now, the other thing that you want to look at, we're going to look at the types of benefits later, but basically they are payable. If you want to get the full benefit, you need to come in the earliest is 55 years and it will apply to people who do laborious work, arduous work, ordinarily at 60 years. And uh, late retirement will be at 65. But even as you look at these kinds of retirements, they would also apply where an injury has arisen. So when that injury has, uh, arises, it might affect the, the maturity. You may claim before you hit 55, 60, or 65. You could also claim in the case of an illness. We'll look at that. And lastly, you can claim in the case of a death. So let us look at some of these benefits. They are simply as follows. Number one, on the pensions. The first pension that you have is the retirement pension. This one is the one that we know so well. When we are in town, you see the elderly queuing at POSB and some of those banks. It is basically for the NASA returns. So what uh, happens is, you need to have contributed for more than 10 years. 10 years, that's the minimum you must contribute. And you must be 55 years in arduous employment for you to become eligible. And secondly, you must not be employed anymore. So it's not just you turning 55 and claiming. You must be 55, unemployed, and having contributed for 10 years and above. And for an ordinary retirement, 60 years and above and unemployed, having contributed for 10 years and above. And then 65 years, that is the latest you can push your annuity and claim thereafter. And 65 years, 10 years of contribution, and you must be unemployed at that time. You must have retired. The other uh, pension that we have is the pension that applies to an invalid. Uh, I, I wish to to draw a distinction here. This term is invalid, invalid, not invalid, invalid, not, not um, like invalid, there is nothing. No, 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 no. An invalid is someone who is um, disabled somehow. So what happens is for you to um, get the pension that applies to an invalid, this invalid ought to have uh, contributed for a year and above, a year and above. And if you have contributed for 12 months and above, and you are less than 65, you are eligible for the invalid's pension, subject to the following condition. You must have a doctor's letter certifying that you have been injured to such an extent that you cannot continue to work under any circumstances. Under those provisions, you are going to be eligible for the invalid's Ancient, provided you're less than 65. Secondly, you have put in a year and above. Let us go to C. C is the survivor's benefit. So you will notice that the first one we looked at was the retirement pension, which applies to the contributor. The second one is the invalid's pension, which also applies to the contributor. Now, when you get to the survivor's pension, the survivor's pension basically covers the following groups. There are four groups, I think. The first group is the spouse or spouses. The second group, children. Third group, parents. Fourth group, other dependents. So these are split into categories. These are their categories. For the spouse, she's going to be eligible to 40%. And 
Secondly, for the children, another 40%. Now we remain with 20%. For the parents, 12%. And lastly, for any other dependents, 8%. Now, let us break this apart a little bit. You will notice that in the first 40%, we're talking about a spouse or spouses because it does not necessarily mean one spouse can claim. Which other spouses can claim? If you are married in terms of the customary law, you can go up to five or seven spouses. All these spouses are going to fit in within the 40%. So ultimately, these spouses may end up claiming 5% of whatever is payable. And secondly, not only should this spouse be married at law, even when the commissioner looks at people who have been cohabiting and is convinced that these should have been a uh, husband and wife to some extent, depending on what he would have considered, such a spouse is going to claim that 40%. And then the next one is the children of the deceased. They are going to get the 40%, depending on how many they are. So if you've been blessed with four children, 10% each. If you have two children, 20% each. If you have one, the whole 40% to that child. And for these children, they ought to be your biological children, even your adopted children, as long as they are your children at law. So the birth certificate is proof that you have registered them as your children. And that particular birth certificate, once it is presented, this particular child is able to claim this benefit until they turn 18 years. And if they still are at school, they'll go up to 25 years. And should it so happen that one of your children or all of your children, uh, unfortunately, they are disabled, they are going to be dependents for life. So they claim that 40% portion until they die. So this is the good part of the law. It does take care of those who are less fortunate than we are. And then secondly, we're also going to look at parents. So for the parents, of course, there should be a paternity proof. The birth certificate would be another document that you can use to prove that these are your parents and they will be entitled to 12%. And should you want to take care of any other dependents, you are limited to 8%. Um, when you look at this, it might not make sense. It might sound like a lot of encroaching. But um, for some people, they are prodigals. Left alone, you may find them having written off the whole pension to somebody else and written their children out, wife out, parents out. So I, I think this structured approach does help bring some sanity so that you don't have many disputes after the death of the contributor. The second type of benefits that you'll get are the grants. We've just looked at the pensions and you're going to realize that the same provisions apply in the grants as they do in the pensions. Now let's look at what would obtain for you to be eligible for a grant. And a retirement grant, you would have contributed for less than 10 years' contribution, even though you are 55 or 60 or 65. You remember that when we looked at the retirement pension, you ought to be 55, 60, 65, and having contributed for more than 10 years. So that particular grant would apply in that case. And then the survivor's grant. This one is prorated for the survivors as we did in the pension. So there were four categories there. We had the wife, you had the children, parents, and any other dependents. So it is still subcategorized in that way. However, when we get to the grant, the survivor's grant, what would happen is uh, on the survivor's grant, you're going to be limited to about 8% of uh, the annual insurable earnings multiplied by the years that you have contributed. That is how it would work. And last, let's look at the invalid's grant. The invalid's grant is the one that will apply to the contributor. So the invalid's grant, the pension that applied to the invalid, we say the invalid ought to have contributed for a year and above and be less than 65. Now you're going to realize that with the invalid, the person ought to have contributed for six months to less than a year. So this is the limitation 0.5 to one of a year. So if you've contributed that way, so it's based on the contributions basically. I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure you're noticing this. So that particular pro proportion becomes your invalid's grant. And when you have uh, the survivors claiming from that invalid's grant, 
they cannot claim more than the contributor would have claimed. So it's not open-ended where you can say someone is, um, has a child that is disabled, so they claim for life. No, they do not claim for life. This time they are limited by what the chief contributor would have earned. So this is the NASA deduction. So what have we covered so far? A, the AIDS levy and the NASA contributions. AIDS levy, 3%, 3%. NASA contributions, 3.5, 3.5. Now, when we get to pay as you earn, this one I'm just going to cover in passing. Uh, our interest here is just on the legal concept, not the computations of payee. This you're going to do in tax law, as I've already mentioned. Where do we find this? Basically, we find the income tax in the Income Tax Act. Interesting, right? It is in the Income Tax Act. So what we find in the Income Tax Act is that basically in order for us to establish what this tax is, it is a tax that is paid by the employee. So how is this paid? We're going to go to the gross income. When we have the gross income, we want to factor out the deductions because now we're looking at the tax liability. So when you have factored out the deductions, what are some of these deductions? NASA, which we've already mentioned. Trade tools. You know, I, actually as I was reading, I was just thinking to myself, I, I, think, I think I should uh, go for um, a Mac, yeah, an eight gig, a Mac, a Mac one, and, uh, and uh, try it out uh, with NASA and say, these are the tools of my trade as the deputy registrar. Surely I can't buy a peak. I can't buy anything. The tools of my trade are a computer. So um, I want to find out if this is going to work. Um, but ordinarily, when you're talking about the tools of the trade, uh, people will be talking about your plane, your chisels for a carpenter, uh, for a cobbler. You're talking about grinders for shoes. Um, those are the tools of the trade. But as long as you can prove that these are the tools of the trade, those will be deducted from your gross income so that we can establish what the tax income is. So the taxable income is going to be less this. The other thing that you can also take out on the deductions would be your approved donations. So donations to your old people's homes, donations to your uh, identified hospitals or mission hospitals, these are some um, areas that you can donate to and you're going to get a tax deduction. So when we looked at um, deductions, when we were looking at, um, was that section six? Sub, I mean, subsection six of uh, section 12. When we're looking at those deductions, what we're looking at there were the deductions that an employer is compelled by law to deduct from your salary. But now when we're looking at these deductions, we're looking at the deductions that have to be factored out before we establish what the taxable income ought to be. So we'll come back to the gross income. That's, uh, that's something else altogether. We're going to look at that. But um, here's the other thing that you can also factor out, uh, professional subscriptions. So you can have uh, professional subscriptions if you are a nurse, if you are a lawyer, the law society, um, and, and any professional subscriptions, you can uh, have them uh, deducted from your uh, tax income. So basically what have we covered? Gross income, minus deductions will give us the tax, tax income. So when we have the taxable income, what then happens is you now go to the tax tables. We are, going to, we are not going to look at the tax tables here. Go to the tax tables and apply the tax rate that applies to the band where you are. So when you get to the bands, what happens is you would have a band that says this is tax-free. If you're earning so much, you are below the, the certain level, you're you are tax-free, you're not taxed. Even when you talk about bonuses, uh, next year, look out for this. You're going to find a situation whereby the minister is going to uh, stipulate what the bonus would be, and he's going to also stipulate a bonus exemption. So most companies that are not doing too well, guess what they do? They just wait for that bonus exemption, and they peg their bonuses to make sure that their employees earn right on the mark they're going to get more value than to pay them a lot that ends up being gobbled by the taxes. So what happens there is that when you are now calculating that, you're basically going to say salary 
from the salary, add the bonus. After the bonus, factor out the bonus exemption so that you would know what the balance ought to be as you're calculating the taxable income. So when you now have that, you're going to apply the applicable rate. Maybe let's assume it's about 25%. Having applied that, what then should you do? Remove the tax credits. What are some of these tax credits? You could have uh, tax credits such as um, uh, your medical expenses. You could have tax credits such as um, your disability um, related expenditure where you are incurring expenses for purchase of, let's say, um, a wheelchair for someone who's an invalid or you're modifying a car for someone who, who had their feet amputated. Now they, they need to maneuver the car with their hands only. If you were to do that, that becomes a tax credit. So all these tax credits, guess what they do? When you now have your, your tax liability is already stated, so what happens is you begin to reduce that. So it's that um, issue of um, debit the receiver, credit the giver. Yeah. So a, a credit is something that you're going to be given. So towards your tax liability, what does it do? It reduces that tax liability because it's a credit. It's positive and uh, your tax liability is negative. So what we're saying is you have minus five, you add $3, what do you have? Minus two, that's what you own the state. So if you have a situation whereby you're going to have uh, $10 and you have uh, your tax liability at minus five, guess what? You're going to have a positive $5. So this is where now you carry over. You don't have to pay the taxes. I hope this makes sense. So as you go into this, you need to then look at that closely to say, what then are these credits and where can we use them? So when the employer now factors out the credits, what is the next thing he's going to do? That 3%, the AIDS levy, is now added at the end. Why is the AIDS levy being added? Because we need to know what the tax liability is before adding the AIDS levy. Because the Finance Act, or you're going to find it also referred to as the Charging Act, it says these are to be paid together. So the AIDS levy and the tax, the pay as you earn, is going to be paid together. So you couple them. That the total of those two is what becomes your liability to the state. That becomes your taxable income. I mean, your, your tax liability. So what the employer should now do is hold on to that. Withdraw it from your salary so that they pay it to the state. Why should they do this? It is the responsibility of the employer, not that of the employee to return the payee. And what is the net effect of not doing this? Now, let us come to go to the 13th schedule of the Income Tax Act. I draw your attention to paragraph 10 and we want to look at subparagraph 1. Listen to what it says. Subject to the provisions of paragraph 11, an employer who fails to withhold or to pay to the commissioner any amount of employees' tax as provided in paragraph 3 shall be personally liable for the payment to the commissioner not later than the date on which payment should have been made if the employees' tax had been withheld in terms of paragraph 3 of A. Listen to this. The amount of the employee's tax which he failed to withhold or to pay to the commissioner. And, take note, we are adding. So what is going to happen is you are going to pay what was true. You are liable to pay it. Then B, a father. That means in addition, a father amount equal to such employee's tax. So what we're finding here is in NASA, we had a, a surcharge of 10%. In essence, when we come to payee, you're going to have a surcharge of 100%. So if you decide to play around with the tax man's money, it will cost you 100% more. And this particular provision was an area of disputation 
in a case, a 2017 case that was uh, decided by the Supreme Court of Zimbabwe. It was uh, Arundel Schools and uh, School and others, it was Chisipiti and all others. There, there were six of them, and they took on Zimra. And this matter now escalated and reached the uh, Supreme Court. This is basically what happened. The employer had uh, employees, these schools had employees who were being given a subsidized fee or concessionary fee for their students. Have you noticed where you have a scenario where they would say, your parent is already working for the organization, so you're going to pay 80%, you're going to pay 70%, you're going to pay 50% or something like that. So what then they did, they did not factor this particular concession of the 30%, 25% or 20%, whatever the concession was. They did not factor it in. Where was it supposed to be factored in? In the gross income. Why the gross income? Because a definition of the gross income is inclusive of incorporeal property, is inclu inclusive of property that is deemed to have been received. So we're going to get to that. So the court had an opportunity to look into this. And as it did, it found that all these were benefits, all these were advantages, and such benefits and advantages were supposed to be added to the income. Let's, let's go back a bit. Math, let's go back. We said gross income minus the deductions will give us the taxable income. So if you do not factor in all the benefits, your taxable income is going to be wrong. It's going to be understated. So you're paying less to the taxman. So when you do not withhold that, now we go back to uh, Schedule 13, Paragraph 10, Subparagraph 1. You're going to pay what was owing. And in addition, you're going to pay furthermore what was owing. So these guys then took on Zimra. And as they got there, the court now got an opportunity to give us more detail on this. Listen to, um, sec I mean, this is uh, section 8 and uh, subsection 1. For the purposes of this act, gross income means the total amount received by or accrued to or in favor of a person or, the court then highlighted this, deemed to have been received by or to have accrued to or in favor of a person in any year of assessment from a source within or deemed to be within Zimbabwe. So the court then goes on to say the aspect of it being deemed. This is an income. And, and, and we must um, appreciate the, the element of accrual. I'm talking to the accounts majors now. For, 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 for revenue to accrue to you, it does not necessarily mean you have already received it. But when students come through and... Um, they, they make a commitment that they are going to pay whatever is the receivable is realized as revenue that has accrued before it is collected. So what we're looking at is, this is a scenario whereby when you are paying fees, the assumption is in the uh, accounts department, in the um, bank account of the school or the college where your child is studying, there is a 20% that is already accrued in that account. You are now owing 80%. So if you look at it mathematically, you will understand what the court was dealing with. To say these are funds that have already accrued. You don't necessarily have to hold them in your hand, but you must believe you already have them and conduct yourself as if you already have them because they are guaranteed. So the court then goes on to say, when you look at this, you also want to look at part B, deemed to have been received. So we talked about deeming, where you, someone does not have a contract will be deemed to have a contract. So if they are deemed to have received, even though it is a fictional receipt, it is deemed. It's as if they have been given 20% and they have been told, add 80% and go and pay. So this is the part of deeming and the accrual. I think I've explained it using a bit of some business terminology there. So if you have such a scenario, guess what? This is part of gross income. Go back to our formula, gross income, anything that is deemed, anything that has accrued. Now let's go to paragraph B in the same. It reads as follows. Any amount so received or accrued in respect of services rendered or to be rendered, whether due or payable 
under any contract of employment or service or not, blah, 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 it went on. So if it is um, an accrual, if it is deemed to have been received, based on that, you are going to work for the employer for the next three months. So when, when you are getting a, a school benefit, when you're getting a, a school fees concession, you, you are not getting a concession for the months that you've already worked. You're getting a concession for the months you are yet to work because your child is going to be at school for three months before the term ends. They're going to be at school for three and a half months before the semester ends. So when the employer pays that, it is anticipation in anticipation that you're going to continue in your employment for the next three and a half years. I mean, three and a half uh, months. So if you're going to have a scenario whereby even the employer pays for the annual fees, some organizations do that. So when they do so, they are paying in anticipation of services that you are going to render for the foreseeable 11 to 12 months that follow. So this is what we are looking at. So any amount, a, amount so received or accrued in respect of services rendered or to be rendered, whether due and payable under any contract of employment. So if these are the terms of the contract, actually the, the, the lawyer who was arguing this actually wanted to argue to say it is actually the employee who has the right to the education of their children, not the children who have a right to be educated by the company. So because of that, this becomes a benefit to the employee. Now let's also look at the last part before we go to what the, I mean, the court found. In terms of uh, section two of the act, an amount is defined as amount for the purposes of the provisions of this act relating to the determination of the gross income, income or taxable income as defined, defined in subparagraphs one of section eight of a person means A, money, or B, that's the one we want to look at, any other property, corporeal, or incorporeal, having an ascertainable money value. So if you can attach value to it, it is an income. If you can say it is worth so much, it is an income to you. So this is what uh, Judge Appellate uh, Uchena had to say. In my view, these provisions are wide enough to cover all money and any other property, corporeal or incorporeal, which has an ascertainable monetary value. Non-monetary items which have an ascertainable monetary value are included in terms of this provision. A non-monetary item can only escape if it has no ascertainable value. It is obvious that the benefit received by the employees of their parents is an incorporeal thing with an ascertainable value. As such, the advantage received by the employees of the appellants falls within the broad definition of the term gross income. So, this is a gross income. So, if you're going to receive any concession, it's a gross income. And there are some other benefits you're going to find these are stated clearly that you want to look at. All these benefits must go into your gross income. What are some of these, um, Mr. Businessman, Lady Business? Um, the other benefits would be your company car. If you are issued with a company car, it is supposed to be ascertained its value based on the engine size. And secondly, even if you have a company house that you reside in and you're not in a mission station, you are supposed to be charged the market rate of that particular house or at least 12.5% of your basic salary. If you are living in a furnished house, which is furnished by the employer, you are supposed to be liable to 8% of the cost of furniture. And as far as cash allowances are concerned, any cash allowance where the employer has no control on how it is used, you know, like a wardrobe allowance, if you have um, your, um, your cell phone allowance or your internet allowance, where the employer has no control over your consumption, those are supposed to be taxable as an income to you. And then as far as education assistance is concerned, you can only claim 50% of education assistance for three of your children. Thereafter, you're fully liable for the rest. And should you have a situation where you're looking at the credits? Uh, for the credits, you remember we looked at uh, medical expenses. So if you have credits, 
you're going to claim for credits that would cover maybe, let's look at 50% uh, uh, of your medical expenses for um, someone who's an invalid or anyone you could have contributed to who is a legal dependent of yours. But it is not a full cover for these. So I'm not going to go into those in depth in the interest of time. But this is what I want us to end on. What we need to appreciate is that even though we are looking at the gross income, these ultimately are deductions that the employer has to ensure that they are deducted in terms of section 12, subsection 6, and paragraph B, which says amounts which an employer is compelled by law or legal process to pay on behalf of an employee. My dear friends, this has turned out to be a lengthy discussion, even though we only scratched the surface. What we have been looking at are the deductions. Three deductions, AIDS levy, NASA, and payee. I hope you should be able to discuss this at least to some extent. What we have covered so far, recruitment, remuneration, and in remuneration we covered both uh, the contract and deductions. And uh, we're going to move over to the renegotiation of the contract where we'll be looking at strikes and job actions. Until we meet again, may God bless you. Peace be unto you. Amen.